Hey, Texas Shrug, this is part two. Check out part one first. Just made a few days ago, if you're coming upon this first. Um, so here we go. Now, there was a movement going on in the late 1800s. And remember, L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz book, written perhaps 1898, 1899, published in 1900 exactly. So there was a severe depression at that point. And it was even uh, harder at the end of the Civil War because the greenback, which was the paper money at the time, unbacked fiat paper money used during the Civil War, was completely wiped out. And um, the banksters after the Civil War were establishing control again. You need to go through the banks. Government must not issue money directly to the people. Of course, that's what would benefit all of us, but what they've put in place is what benefits the one-tenth of one percent. So what was being proposed in the late 1800s in a storm of populism was something called the free silver monetary system. And this storm of populism against the banksters, how the, how the America could rise up against the banksters, is represented on Dorothy's farm during the storm by the tornado in the Wizard of Oz. So remember, this, this populist movement was called the free silver monetary system. And remember what we discussed in part one about the absolute cancer of this society um, being the need to ask bankers to create money for us. The government can't even create money on its own. They have to ask the bankers, and then we have to pay them back with real money and interest. Please watch part one. This scheme that they've set up is almost unbelievable. And no one's aware of it, of course, in terms of what they're really doing to us. So in the free silver monetary system, currency and coin would be silver-based, of course, and issued directly from government to local jurisdictions and the people. Now, based on what we know today, there is no doubt this system would absolutely have led to the most prosperity for America. And remember, most importantly, it cuts out the bankers. It's direct currency issuance to the people, or even to government itself. Today, in the system they've set up, the banks have to create the money. So that free silver movement would have cut out the vampire middlemen, the banksters, who over a millennia have set up control mechanisms where only they can create and loan the money, even to their own government. It isn't quite remarkable if you understand it. Um, it must come from the banks before it passes through any government, or certainly to the people. And remember from part one, the original Wizard of Oz, Dorothy did not have ruby slippers. She had silver shoes. Silver slippers walking upon the yellow brick road of gold bars, which of course represents the gold-backed monetary system. And remember, like we talked about, who controls the gold today? A gold-backed monetary system is no panacea, because it's our controllers that are in control of all the gold. So we have the tornado and whirlwind of populism off to confront the controllers and the banksters themselves finding their way to the Emerald City. So Dorothy starts out alone, who I think represents a regular American, both as an individual and as a collective. She sets off down the yellow brick road, and as we all know along the way, she picks up three others into her party. The Scarecrow does represent a literal army of American farmers that existed at the time. At first, the farmers are depicted without a brain, because that's the way they were seen by the oh-so-smart bankers, oligarchs, corporate titans, politicians, and other Harvard men that have their diplomas. But as it's clearly displayed in the book and the movie, the brainless straw man and scarecrow is pretty much the most astute of the bunch. The tin man is picked up second, and in this rising tide of populism and sound money, real money, headed to Emerald City, finally ready to push back on this banking scam. Tin Man represents the American worker as a collective, millions and millions of workers. More specifically, the factory worker needs oil to run the factory. Even if um, factories, for the most part, no longer exist in the United States, and now they're all in China, we're pretty familiar with factories. But to Frank Baum, seeing for the first time what factories were all about, like five floors of garment workers in really horrible conditions sitting next to each other in some sort of sweatshop, this must have been all very shocking to L. Frank Baum. And at the turn of the century, we you know Henry Ford took 
you know, the assembly line and the work of factory, I want to say leaps further, but really, because the factory workers then just put on one piece or did one little thing, and they didn't even see the outcome uh, of what they were doing and never touched the end product. So to Frank Baum, the new worker represent more of a robot or a tin man without a heart, without moral feeling, without putting his finger on the final product. So Dorothy uh, comes upon the American workforce, represented by the Tin Man, all rusted out in poor shape, and again a victim of the bankers that she and the new system uh, will try to revive, at least initially, with a little bit of oil. The explanation of what the Cowardly Lion represents, who joins the party next, I personally at first rejected it, saying there's no way. Um, but again, you have to look at this through Frank Baum's eyes, the end of the 1800s. And again, as I've said in part one, it's most likely the symbolism is not as dark as you probably want it to be to be entertained. He probably wasn't a 33 degree Mason, even if he was a Mason. Um, we know Masons at the lower level, uh, people that I've even interacted with at my dad's club, they don't have any idea of what uh, might exist at the top levels, of course. So um, the Cowardly Lion, from my research, represents a politician of the time, and his name was William Jennings Bryan, who uh, came into um, popularity in the 1890s. Now, he was a politician running against future President William McKinley, who, not surprisingly, was a friend of the banksters and the gold-backed monetary system. Now, William McKinley today is kind of heralded as uh, someone that's very, very, uh, should be perhaps put on Mount Rushmore because one of the few presidents that pushed for gold-backed money. And gold-backed money, I would even say, is way better than just pure banker-issued fiat. But as we talked about, gold-backed money is a is a false ruse. It is a situation that I'm sure the controllers are just happy to live with if they ever have to and we ever have to go back there again. But currency issued directly to the people, even fiat, is what's best. We don't have time to go down that path right now. Let me go back. So Williams Gen William Jennings Bryan lost to William McKinley, but he was a big proponent of this free silver movement. That's currency issued directly from government to government to the people that cut out the banksters. And as we know, uh, Williams Jennings Bryan never became president, and also the people saw him as backing off on what he should have just kept pushing for, this free silver movement and direct monetary issuance to the people. So apparently the politician, boy, what a coincidence, became wishy-washy or backed off his position a bit, and William Jennings Bryan was soon known as a coward for not pushing the silver movement as aggressively as he promised he would. Thus, he becomes the cowardly lion in the story. Now, again, I wish for entertainment's sake there was a darker meaning. There is not. I'm here to deliver the truth. So Dorothy's party is following the money and skipping along the yellow brick road following the money of gold towards the Emerald City or the capital of government or Penn Am or Washington, D.C. The gold and the gold standard is what keeps the elites both in government and in industry in power. And if not the gold standard, the ability... Uh, to force government to only get their money, whether it's gold-backed or not, from the bankers. And again, never to issue it directly. That is the key. In contrast, this populist silver movement threatens the very existence of the banksters. And remember, Dorothy in the book is wearing silver slippers, not ruby slippers. I assure you that although the rumor states that, oh, the ruby slippers just showed up better uh, in uh, Technicolor when we did the movie, no, 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 no. The silver slippers, no doubt about it, would have tipped people off absolutely that the Wizard of Oz is a giant monetary allegory or metaphor or making a statement about sound money. You remove the silver slippers and you put on ruby slippers and you concoct a story that, oh, that looks better on Technicolor and it looked better as we filmed it. You're taking away people's ability to see what the symbology really is and what Frank Baum wanted to say. The other thing that's very interesting is how come he couldn't say it directly? We'll get back to that. Now, Dorothy starting out alone and then gaining companions along the way is significant because it shows how the movement must gain momentum before it reaches the Emerald City. 
remember the Scarecrow and Tin Men uh, collectively represent about 80 million people in my estimation at the turn of the century, 1900. Now to the big one, the Wicked Witches. It's not my original thought, but I believe this research is accurate. Others have come up with this. I believe the Wicked Witch of the West represents John D. Rockefeller, other banksters, big industry. The Wicked Witch of the East, more traditional big banksters, perhaps J.P. Morgan himself. You see, Dorothy, the people, represented by Dorothy, always had the power to kill the banksters. The Wicked Witch of the East. She did kill the Wicked Witch of the East. And now that she's wearing the magic of the silver slippers, not ruby, but silver slippers, she has now controls the silver system. She now has the power to not only kill one bankster, or one witch, but to take down all the Wicked Witches and even the Wicked Witch of the West. Remember, the Wicked Witch of the West scolded Dorothy, remember, to turn over the slippers to her for the idea is precious metals and the control of money and the control of silver should not be under the control of you mindless masses, you regular Americans, you great unwashed or idiot proletariat. Remember the, the witch? Give them to me! They're of no use to you! I pretty, or maybe she said that, I don't know. If Dorothy's housing crash... That's interesting. Dorothy's housing crash was capable of wiping out the Wicked Witch of the East and her banksters. Well, then the Wicked Witch of the West is just more than eager to take over the tyranny and get the slippers back for herself. But the, the Wizard of Oz is very clear. If Dorothy can can keep control of the silver slippers, then she, you know, remember the, the good witch says you will be safe as long as you stay in these slippers. You will be protected from the wicked witch of the West and protected from the banksters as long as you can keep control of the silver system. Meaning the people would finally have access to real money, silver money, issued directly by the government without the need to include the vampires. And at this point in the story, if I have to tell you who the vampires represent, you haven't been paying attention. Now, as Dorothy and her party approach the Emerald City, we know what happens. They're lured into a poppy field. And remember, poppies create opium, and opium is heroin. So they're lured to sleep. And this section is completely open for interpretation and is entirely subjective, but to me, it's the old trick politicians play that's gone on from time immemorial. The British did it to the Chinese in the opium fields, and you keep the citizenry drunk, asleep, drugged, or all three. Especially if it's determined they're on the verge of knowing something, or they're on the verge of accomplishing something, or finding out the truth. Anything that impacts the power or the wealth of those that control society is a threat. Okay, so not in the book, but in the movie, they're asleep in the poppies, and the good witch of the South, Glenda, steps in, wakes them up with snowfall. We all know what happens. Now, what the good witch of the South represents is open for anybody's interpretation. It's all over the place, and this is just personally what I think it could mean from the best I could research this. But it could represent the South in general in a post-slavery era. Um, at the time, you know, not corrupted by the new slave masters, the banksters, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the titans of industry, nor were there any megabanks that were situated or resided in the South. It was all Northeast, of course, the banksters. Uh, finally, uh, as we know, duality is an essential part of the religion of our controllers. I'm not going to go any farther than that, but it could be as simple as if you've got a wicked witch of the east and west, you've got to have a good witch of the north and south. It balances the yin and yang and creates the duality. I will leave it at that. To me, uh, the flying monkeys, although it's said they represent Hopi Indian tribes, and I, I don't, I don't know if I buy into any of that. To me, it's pretty simple. They are simply the um, the baton, the gun, the military, and the enforcement arm of our controllers. Call it the police, the FBI, the NSA. It, you know, they're dispatched by who really runs things, dispatched by the Wicked Witch of the West, out the window, the flying monkeys go. They're dispatched by the titans of industry and the banksters who really control all the politicians, and it's simply the enforcement arm that will, you know, put your arm behind your back into a chicken wing and force compliance. That's what the flying monkeys are to me. 
One other thing of note here, and I really shouldn't stray because my goal was to stay to uh, what Frank Baum intended in the original and not get too much into the Illuminati Hollywood interpretations, but it is relevant here. Um, what's interesting is who sleeps when the poppies take effect? The real people sleep. Um, the uh, cowardly lion sleeps and Dorothy sleeps, but the Tin Man and the Scarecrow who, um, this is where you get into the scarecrow potentially representing uh, the straw man, of course, the legal fiction, which is the uh, legal corporation that's created for each one of us via a birth certificate in all caps, and of course a legal fiction that operates under your name throughout the legal system. And again, I am no expert in this area at all. I mean, watch, uh, go see Sophia Smallstorm if you want more about this. But of course a legal fiction would not... Uh, be succumbed to poppies and fall asleep. Uh, no, nor would um, you know the Tin Man if he was completely hollowed out and the workforce has now become more robotic than it was a moral man. Nor would he succumb to the slumber of poppies if he wasn't real at all, because he was simply a Tin Man, a tax identification number for your corporate fiction. We could go on and on down this road. Or again, I am not expert, but I thought it was interesting to comment here. Sigue el camino amarillo. 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 Sigue el camino amarillo.